Well, welcome everyone to this episode of the great webinar seminar series. I'm Andrew Zorneman with Kane Academy. I'm so glad that you could join me. I know this is a busy time of year, especially for teachers. You're planning out your final uh, seminars, maybe uh, giving out some final writing assignments. You're starting to collect um, all the materials you need to wrap up a good semester, maybe even begin to to evaluate your students, and you're looking toward the summer, uh, perhaps for some professional development, some travels, and you're even looking toward the next uh, school year. So thanks for for coming out on on a, on a busy a busy day and a busy week and a busy time of year. I hope this seminar uh, episode tonight is really helpful to you, and uh, I look forward to uh, sharing a few thoughts and uh, fielding some questions. I wanted to let you know a couple of things as we get started, that the first three episodes of the great seminar webinar series are now posted on our website. So if you're interested in catching any one of those, if you missed part of one or you missed all of, of one, or maybe you missed all three uh, and you're interested, please uh, go to our website. When you land on our page, our homepage at www.kanaacademy.org, You'll see there are three yellow buttons. The one to the farthest right says join a webinar. And uh, if you just open that up and then scroll to the bottom of the webinar page, you'll see that three episodes are loaded up there for your use. And I uh, hope they are of good use to you and kind of pump some life into your seminar leadership. I also want to remind you that at any time, uh, whether it's an anticipation of a particular episode or just uh, say on the fly, you're, you're 24 hours ahead of time, you're looking forward to a seminar that you have to lead and you have a question about how to conduct leadership, how to launch that particular discussion with a really good question, what resources maybe to bring in in support uh, of the conversation, anything like that, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email address is on the seminar uh, or I should say the webinar page. Uh, I also wanted to say that uh, sometimes uh, school leaders and teachers, academic deans, master teachers are looking to pump more life into seminar leadership in general for their team. And if you're looking for someone to help you this summer, uh, well, uh, Look, we have several great master teachers, and we love serving schools. We love working with teachers. So if you're looking for someone to come to your school this summer, or if you're nearby Falls Church, Virginia, and you'd like to come to our headquarters, or if you're far away and you want to travel and get a break from wherever you are and come out to this part of the country and maybe uh, take in the sights uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, go to... Uh, um, you know, Bull Run or Manassas Battlefield, uh, see the National Gallery of Art, um, take a boat ride on the Chesapeake. Uh, sure, come on out. We'd love to put on a program for you and uh, we'll meet your needs and we'll, we'll design a program just for your team. Uh, we don't deal in cookie cutter uh, programs. We can, we can adapt to what your needs are. You can reach us at info at kanaacademy.org, and that's C-A-N-A, -A, as in Cana, the Wedding Feast of Cana, academy.org. The May uh, 2nd episode of the Great Seminar Webinar Series, or they should say, the not May 2nd, but the two episodes in May on the Great Seminar Webinar Series are as follows. May 16th, we're going to have leading seminars with the two-by-two -two method. Uh, that's one of our great methods. You can study that method in detail in a terrific guide that we have on uh, a Lively Kind of Learning, Mastering the Seminar Method by Jeanette Sells Warneman. That's available at our website. But we're going to work through uh, that method as a great method for handling seminar discussions, leading seminar discussions on uh, works of fiction. And then on May 30th, that's May 16th, that'll be the one on leading seminars with the two-by-two -two method. On May 13th, I'll be talking about leading your students through history. History is one of the most confused uh, topics in the country right now. Uh, a lot of seminar leaders are well-trained in imaginative and expository literature, but uh, sometimes not so much in history. And history increasingly is a controversial topic. I think I have a pretty good way to tackle history, especially in the context of a seminar. 
So uh, join me on May 30th. I think you'll find it really helpful and insightful and, and maybe even inspiring. Tonight, we're talking Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, and uh, we'll be answering your questions as well. If you have any questions uh, about the uh, particulars of tonight's presentation, go ahead and fire away in the uh, the Q&A uh, box there at the bottom of your screen, uh, on your Zoom screen. Uh, also, I've collected some questions that people have written in, so I'll be happy to to answer those and share my answers with everybody as we go along. Toward uh, our discussion, I want to share um, my uh, screen with you, and I'm going to pull up um, a slide presentation, and we'll use it as kind of an outline to get ourselves into uh, the ethics. And, and what you'll find in the outline is a mix of things. Some of it um, is kind of uh, touching on uh, in an outline way, some of the major topics covered within the the very broad and rich uh, body of Aristotle's text. Uh, some of them are questions. And remember, um, I've said, of, of all the things you can do, perhaps the most important thing you can do in preparing for a seminar discussion is to work up really good questions. And uh, I'm going to give probably uh, 12 or so, uh, 14 or so, really good questions by which to drive a good discussion about book one of uh, the Nicomachean Ethics. And uh, at the very end of the slideshow, I'll show you a really good resource if you want to build on your uh, your ability to ask really good questions on this text. So without further ado, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, let me, uh, I'm in a little... Something's in the middle of my screen. I want to get rid of it here. Let me, okay, there we go. Thanks everybody for your patience. I appreciate that. It's my fourth episode and I'm still getting <laughs> used to uh, handling uh, technological glitches. All right, so we're going to talk about leading a great seminar on Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics. Uh, let me start with this first observation. Someone wrote, uh, I think, Probably the day that we posted that tonight's episode would be on this text, someone wrote me and said, I'm all I'm so excited about it. I got my text already and I want to know how to pronounce the name. And I, I want to tell you that all the professors that I've had, and I think I've had four of them who've uh, led me through the Nick and McKean ethics, I'll, I'll say Nick and McKean. And um, let me and then I'll talk a little bit about where that name comes from in just a minute. The the name probably comes from one of two sources, and either one is the name Nicomachus. And uh, there's some controversy over exactly who Aristotle's father was, but more commentators than not, at least the ones that I've read, say that his father's name was Nicomachus. Also, Aristotle had a son named Nicomachus. Uh, one thing that's kind of uh, wonderful about this is that Nicomachus means uh, a victor in battle. And uh, that may make more sense as a name for a work in ethics uh, as we uh, move along through the content of the text. So uh, apart from sort of the biographical foundation for the name, there's also that, that uh, meaningful uh, source, and that is the, the meaning of the word Nicomachus, is a victor in battle. He was born, uh, that is Aristotle, was born in 384 BC in Stagyrus, and uh, if you if you put your finger on a map of Athens, uh, which is in Attica, and you move uh, north uh, northeast, uh, you'll you'll land on uh, where that is. Uh, he studied. Um, he moved around a little bit as a young man. Then he, he ended up in Athens to study with Plato. So he was a student of Plato. Uh, he learned a lot from him. He's but he's not uncritical. And you'll find in the body of the Nicomachean Ethics some a critical reflection on the content of Plato's uh, philosophy. Uh, he founded a, um, a couple of academies uh, elsewhere than Athens. Uh, among other things, he is noted for having tutored Alexander of Macedon, the, the son of Philip. Alexander, of course, will go on to be what we now call Alexander the Great. Uh, that will turn out to be something of a controversy for uh, Aristotle later on. 
In 335 BC, he founded his most famous academy, and that is the Lyceum in Athens. And um, in 323, which was the year that Alexander died, he fled Athens because at the death of Alexander, there was something of a revolt, a uh, revolt, you know, uh, denouncing the, the name of Alexander. So Aristotle had to flee. And he, he went to a place called Chalcis, which is also uh, north of Athens, but further north than his birthplace. And he died there in 322 BC. He left us an enormous amount of work. Never was there a man who uh, organized his thought about such a wide range of subject matters. He's the father of the arts and sciences. He's the father of the liberal studies, which include uh, the arts and sciences, uh, arts like um, the poetics and uh, the rhetoric um, sciences like his uh, studies in biology, physics, and uh, metaphysics. The word science there is not uh, only applied to a field of, of natural study, what we would call, say, physics, chemistry, geology, biology, but rather to any organized body of thought. So he would call the study of politics political science. Uh, he would study uh, metaphysics, which is not about the material world. Uh, he would call that a science. Uh, it's interesting that as the father of uh, liberal studies, the liberal arts and sciences, Aristotle never developed history as either an art or a science. Um, he mentions it uh, in several places, uh, it, mostly in his work on poetics. Uh, he mentions in his work on rhetoric that uh, one uh, ought to know things from the past in order to make a persuasive case about what to do here in the present. Uh, and in his studies of uh, natural history, he works up the history of, sp of s species. Um, and uh, so it looks kind of like history. As a political scientist, he collected uh, all the constitutions of his time and worked through them and categorized them, much like an historian would do. But he never had he never wrote a book. Uh, he never uh, collected a set of lectures anyway on uh, history proper, which is a, is a curious thing. This work, uh, of course, is a work in ethics. Uh, the word ethics is rooted in the Greek word ethos. Sometimes we think of the ethos as something like the, um, the moral rationale or the moral uh, practices uh, of a group, of a society, of a particular person, a company even. Uh, the, the best notion or the best uh, meaning of the word ethos is the word character. And when you think about character, uh, you know, you, you get a, um, a person, a human person, individual human person in your imagination, and you think about what that person looks like. Most importantly, you think about what kind of person that person is. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, said that he had a dream, right, of, of an America where people are not judged by their outward appearance, so the color of their skin, say, but rather by their character. That is, what kind of mind they have, what kind of heart they have, what kind of what kind of habitual kindness and generosity, magnanimity and uh, justice toward others. That's character. So when we're talking about ethics, we're talking about character, although we're talking a, a, about more than that, and uh, we'll get into that in just a minute. Aristotle uh, typically lectured and... Uh, um, Historians say that one of the ways he would lecture is he would actually walk around and others would follow him and they would have scribes, but he would talk as he was walking. His principal audience for the ethics uh, were what we call strategoi, uh, which translates as strategist, but, might, but maybe more broadly, we should understand the strategoi or the strategists as political and um, military leaders. So military and political leaders need to know um, how uh, the group for which they're organized uh, needs to be provided for, how it should move, uh, move, of course, in the battlefield, but also move in the sense of, you know, grow demographically, grow economically, grow legally, and so forth. So uh, to devise good strategies, uh, you need to learn something. And uh, the Nick and McKean ethics is, is devoted to uh, what strategoi or strategist or military and political leaders ought to learn. These are the kinds of things, by the way, I would tell my students at the beginning of uh, reading Aristotle's Nick McKean Ethics and working through the book in a, uh, a seminar, a set of seminar discussions. I would also say that um, 
while we uh, have a, a book set aside called The Nick and McKean Ethics, and we have a book by Aristotle called The Politics, um, it's not right to think of them as separate, but rather together. In other words, um, the, the two ought to be understood as intertwined. And in fact, the two ought to be understood as uh, under the, the broader umbrella term of politics. That is, we study character as part of our study of politics, at least according to, to Aristotle. Let me give you an example of what he means by that. Um, Aristotle, I mentioned earlier, read all the constitutions of his time. There, were, I think there were 158. He, he and his team worked through the 158 constitutions. And then, uh, like one would as a natural scientist, and you're working through 158 specimens, you start to categorize them and say, some are like the others. And, and uh, he finally distilled all the political types, um, all the poli political types, by the way, that he looked at, uh, he called uh, poli, or each one would be called a polis which roughly translates as either a polity, which is a generic term for any political uh, society or community, or a, a city-state. And of course, the number of citizens in a place like Athens uh, wasn't anything like our modern nation-state. They would only have uh, you know, maybe 25, 30, 35,000 citizens. There were six major kinds of polis. And um, among the six, he uh, also uh, could uh, organize them according to um, their rank, that is a form of hierarchy. So uh, one through six is the ranking. And uh, the one we said, oh, wait a second, democracy is only number four. Uh, well, the reason he says three are good and three are bad is that the ones that are good, these are rulers or, or constitutions that serve everyone's good, benefits everyone in a polity, whereas the bad forms of polity tend to uh, serve only the good of the rulers. And it's most obvious when we look at a, a tyrant. A tyrant is absorbed with himself and is only seeking to serve his, his own uh, benefit. And uh, everyone is, uh, is used at, at expense in order to serve you know, what he wants for himself. Um, Aristotle wasn't very sanguine that you could find truly good men to be monarchs or aristocrats he thought maybe at best you could get a combination of Timocrats and Democrats. That is, uh, Timocrats are, are the uh, property owners and Democrats are the many. And they might have property, they might not, um, but they, uh, the Democrats rule for their own interests and the Timocrats rule generally for everyone's interests, uh, which is kind of founded in um, the principles of property. Okay, that's just a, a, a little glimpse into the kind of... of um, work that Aristotle did in the field of politics. And uh, you can already glimpse why ethics and politics are gathered together. It's because uh, you need good rulers, not bad rulers. And the most fundamental distinction in morality or in ethics is the distinction between what is morally good and what is morally evil or morally bad. So let's move to book one. And as we're making our way through book one, what I typically like to do is, is I say, okay, uh, is it, I'm assuming that everyone's read book one, or maybe they've read the first X number of pages of book one as their reading assignment. And then I'll ask these questions. I'll say, what's the subject matter that Aristotle has introduced in book one? Now, you know, it's easy to say, oh, it's ethics, right? Well, actually, it's not so easy to say ethics if you actually read the content of book one. That is, you start to see what ethics is in its, in its multiple uh, expressions. But... Um, Something else, say, more discreet or more specific emerges as the subject matter. And then I also ask, what is Aristotle's methodology? That is, uh, how, does he, how does he get from the beginning of book one to the end of book one? How does he introduce a topic or a subject and then develop it? And um, just like if he were to introduce um, uh, political types, he would say, okay, I worked through 158. And uh, I found that generally all 158 fall under six categories. Okay, that's methodology. And then I can push it a little bit further and say there are two columns under which they all fall. And the one set serves the good of all, the other set serves only the good of the rulers. Uh, that's methodology. That's how he, he gets from the introducing politics to the conclusion regarding the six major types. So what's the subject matter in book one of the ethics? 
and what is Aristotle's methodology. Let's go to a, a passage early on, right off, right off the bat in the first paragraphs. Every art, he says, or applied science, and every investigation, and similarly every action and choice, seem to aim at some good. The good, therefore, has been well-defined as that at which all things aim. Now, a couple of comments about terminology. And uh, you'll want to work through your students. You want to work with your students uh, through the key terms. Um, you could ask them, you know, what do you think art means? What is art? And so I said, well, I think art generally means painting. I said, okay, when a painter paints a painting, he creates a painting, right? And he, we call him an artist, but we call him a studio artist or a, um, a visual artist. What about, say, um, a, um, a carpenter? Isn't there a kind of art involved in making a beautiful rocking chair? And they say, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, cool. there, there's an art. How about a poet? Yeah, a poet makes a poem. Okay, good. And then uh, what about science? Does the scientist make something? Somebody might say, well, he might invent something, and that's a kind of applied science. And I said, what tools of the trade does he use in order to, to make something? Well, um, he has to know something about chemistry and mathematics, uh, maybe some physics in order to understand how things hold together. Maybe he knows he's working with, um, um, he need, maybe he's inventing something that has to do with uh, helping um, eggshells to be harder so they don't break so fast. Or maybe it's something to help uh, uh, dogs live more healthily and so forth. And so he applies um, in the one hand, on the one hand, agriculture, a kind of science to the eggshells. On the other hand, he applies uh, veterinary science to the health of dogs and so forth. But science is a collection of knowledge. It's an, it's an organized body of knowledge where an art um, is, is the way of making something. Not all science makes things. All art does make something, okay? Uh, similarly, every action and choice, all right? So action is what humans do, and choice is what we make with our wills. So we, we see before us options, A and B, or crossroads, um, or... Um, uh, am I going to call on this student or that student? Is a young man going to ask this girl or that girl or some other girl to dance and so forth? So we all make choices. Now, each art, science, investigation, action, and choice aims at what? Aims at some good. All right. What is a good? Well, let the students uh, work through that and they'll arrive at things like, well, something that's attractive, something that you want, uh, something that makes Mm, something better than it would be if it was not so good. So it was, you know, so uh, a chair that, you know, collapses every time you sit in is not a very good chair. So there must be something about goodness in a chair that has to do with structure, stability, integrity, and so forth. And the good, therefore, has been well-defined as that at which all things aim, okay? So I said, what do you, what, what's the word aim? When you normally think of aim, what, what comes to mind? Oh, well, somebody says, I think about taking aim. You know, I, I aim the basketball at the hoop or I pick an arrow from my quiver and I, I aim it, you know, uh, take the, I, 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 I fire it from my bow. Uh, and um, I might aim a question at an interlocutor or I might aim a compliment at someone who's done something kind to me or I might aim a compliment at my mom who just uh, uh, got a new dress and she's looking terrific and I want to encourage her and uh, compliment her because she she looks so great. All those things are are aims and they're all of different natures, aren't they? I mean, they're really uh, altogether different. You might have a, a bigger aim. For example, uh, a young person in, in your class might say, well, I have an aim in life, a kind of a goal. I want to I want to become a lawyer. So I'm going to go to, after I graduate from this academy, I'm going to go to a university and I'm going to study uh, English and history and, and uh, philosophy. And I'm going to learn how to think even better than I think now. Learn a lot about uh, human beings, learn how to write and, and communicate even better than I do now. And then I'm going to apply to law school. So the person is, the young person is talking about the steps he or she might take toward law school, but they got, they got their eye on something and their, their, their actions, their choices, their investigations are all aiming toward a particular goal. I want to be a lawyer. Aristotle also says, uh, it is clear that there is a difference in the ends at which things aim. So I just, I listed a whole bunch of ones. In some cases, the activity is the end itself, you'd say. In others, 
the end or in a, in other, the end is some product. Okay, so um, now the word, uh, we're going to elaborate on this in just a minute. The word end here in Greek is telos. And you probably heard that word, um, thinking teleologically or the telos of life or all things should be, uh, you know, when we consider morals, morality, especially we're talking about the telos or the, the end, the purpose, the goal, the fulfillment of our nature. What does Aristotle mean by the term end? What does he imply by using the term aim? And of course, end, as we've said, is the is that toward which um, uh, we are are, are the, uh, toward which something is is uh, directed. So it might be an activity. It might be the making of a product. So I want to, if I'm a carpenter and the fa and a family has commissioned me to make. Um, a dining room table, uh, say a harvest table and a, and a bunch of chairs, then the table and the chairs need to be the right kind of height, the right kind of wood and look and the, the right structure, integrity and, and so forth. So that when the family sits down at their, their supper each night, um, the table and the chairs serve their purpose. All right. So the carpenter is making something toward that end. Now, um, it could be that as the family shopping around, they find that there are different kinds of uh, different carpenters in the marketplace and some are remarkably adept at making uh, tables and, and chairs and some are not so adept some of the ones who are adept and those are the ones you want to shop from are super expensive uh, so you know you say okay this is my budget so within my means i need to buy good table and chairs that will hold up will serve our purposes um, but the aim is to buy something a i can afford and b that will serve the purposes that our family needs them to serve, that is to gather us around the table uh, for our meals. Aim also implies that you can miss. So when I say that the carpenters, uh, among the carpenters, there are some that do a really great job and some that don't do a good job, I mean that some of them are shooting their carpenter's arrow and missing the target, all right? Uh, uh, the, and we all know that's, you know, we, you play basketball, you, you miss the shot, uh, you, um, uh, do archery and you you uh, you're uh, either you hit one of the outer rings or you miss the, the the bag altogether right a hunter goes out to shoot and he misses the game at which he's aimed his rifle or his hunting bow i ask the students well, name an action that is the end okay uh, that is an end unto itself name an action whose end is beyond the action then i i might if, if they're having a hard time coming up with answers on their own i i've already given some but i'll give some more I say, okay, let me put four on the on the on the board, and you tell me which ones are ends in themselves, and which ones are sort of means to an end, or or things that are made toward a, another end. How about saddle making? And somebody will say, well, yeah, it's it's to make a good saddle. Isn't that the end? Yes, that's the end. But but does saddle making have another end? Well, yeah, it doesn't serve any purpose in, unless you could put it on a horse or say a camel, but, you know, probably put it on a horse so that the horseback rider can get up on the horse and uh, put his feet in the, in the stirrups and so forth and, uh, and, and ride comfortably and ride, you uh, know, a stable way. And of course the, uh, the tooled leather uh, not only should be attractive, but it should also be highly functional. So it, it sits the person just right. And it fits over uh, the back of the horse. Just so what about horseback riding itself? Well, sometimes horseback riding has related ends. For example, you ride a horse uh, uh, to win a race, or you ride a horse uh, to travel from one city to the next. But then there's, you could just say there's the quality of horseback riding, and there's a sense in which somebody just goes out for a ride. And so, ah, okay, so there's an end unto itself. Sword making. Well, a, a maker of swords uh, is an artisan. And he, and he makes these beautiful and, and very uh, tough and very functional swords. But really, the end of sword making ultimately lies in sword fighting. And sword fighting is a complete thing unto itself. You could say the another end of sword fighting is to, to defeat the uh, your opponent. But, but even in, in um, fencing, uh, let, let's say the, the swords are the kind of uh, foils that are used in fencing. Even then, um, you might lose... But you've still played the sport. You've still fought a good fight, and uh, there's a sense in which um, a sport is complete, and that it's it's not the case that the only purpose of the sport is to win. It's also it's it it inheres in uh, playing the sport itself. 
What's the good at which bridal making aims? This is a, these are other forms of the questions I might ask about thinking in terms of aims, actions, and so forth. Um, uh, what is the good at which practicing than playing a musical instrument aims? Okay, so bridal making aims at making bridles, and bridles are used for horses. And if um, if the if the bridle doesn't fit on the horse, or if it breaks as soon as you pull on it, uh, well then uh, it's not a very good bridle, right? But its purpose, its its ultimate function lies in the relationship between the horse, the rider, and the bridle. What's uh, what's good? What's the good at the uh, at which practicing and playing a musical instrument aims? Well, uh, you uh, take a pianist, and he has uh, two hands, and he's working through a piece, and uh, he'll separate the hands, and he'll he'll do the left hand line of music, and then he'll do the right hand line of music, and then he'll put hands together, and he'll bring it all together, and of course that becomes um, a better uh, mastery of the music, and that's what the practice is driving toward. But ultimately, it's driving toward performance. That is, the, the, the pianist aims at playing the music and playing it well. If he plays it really poorly, we say, oh, that's not really very good music, and I really don't want to listen to it. But you listen to a wonderful pianist, and you, know, you want to listen to it time and time again, and he or she plays it with great proficiency. Let's come back to um, the aims toward which uh, something is in Aristotle's consider considerations of politics. Um, the aim of politics is for the common good. That is the good rule of everyone, not just the, or the, the benefit through good rule for everyone, not just the benefit through rule uh, for the ones who are ruling, right? So even there we say, a ruling has an end which uh, is is uh, encompassed in say the common good or the benefit of everyone and once you get there there's a sense in which you have an end that doesn't really go any further that it's it's a complete end that is the common good or the just order of society aristotle clearly distinguishes between many arts and sciences. In fact, he's the father of arts and sciences, the liberal arts and sciences. He also drives his study uh, to what is either best or highest. Now, I've always distinguished between good bridal making and poor bridal making, good carpentry and bad carpentry, good musicality and poor musicality, good ruling and bad ruling. So we've we've got worse and we've got best. What about, you know, I, I pinpointed monarchy. Uh, the, the good man, the good individual who rules himself well is more likely to be able to rule uh everyone in the polity the man who rules himself badly that he's highly appetitive uh, myopic uh completely self-centered uh and uh, cruel toward everyone else the tyrant right so he doesn't rule himself very well so he's not going to rule everyone else very well so we distinguish there not only between uh, better and worse we've uh, distinguished between best next best and on down the line is there a science that is highest? That is, of all the arts and sciences, is there something that is highest? What is it? Why is it the highest science? So these are questions I would ask my students. And Aristotle gives us a, a funny answer, funny to our modern ear anyway. He says, politics, <laughs> of all things, or political science, is the master science. So he uses the word politics and political science interchangeably. Um, the... Um, what does he mean by master science? Of course, master means to to have uh, you know uh, rulership or governance over everything that's beneath you. A science is the study of or the the body of knowledge having to do with that mastery, with that governance, and so forth. So how could how could the study and the mastery of politics uh, be a master science? In other words, what's under political science? I mean, there, how does it make sense that everything falls under political science as a master science? Well, we begin to answer that question by recognizing that that uh, the distinction between different kinds of goods. Remember, all goods are, are everything's aimed at some good. So you have a multiplicity of goods. Some goods are externally evident, as in the the quality of a good bridal. Some of the goods are internal to a person, and this is where we come into the you know. The, the, the meaning of character or ethics. We, we don't say um, an honest man is honest because he's tall or um, a just man is just because he's uh, 
fleet footed. You know, neither of those things have anything to do with the internal character of the man. Now, it's good to be fleet footed and it's and uh, sometimes it's useful to be tall, but in and of themselves, they don't make for character. But things like honesty, justice, uh, temperate, uh, temperate, um, you know, uh, uh, courageous, all these things indicate a, a man of character. All right. So, and in fact, the hint that I give my students is that, well, if you're having a hard time thinking of goods that are external and goods that are internal, think of, think of the word ethics or character. The highest good, Aristotle says, must be something final. That is, it, it's complete. That is, there's, there's nothing really beyond it uh, that um, we would say the good that we're talking about is pointed toward. Now, this comes back to uh, political science as a master science. Um, it, er, for Aristotle, all goods, including the highest good, would be achievable within the life of the polity. That is, the, any good that a, a person can attain in life is attainable within uh, the, the political community. Ah, okay. So if you're going to arrange for all those goods, you're going to need some science by which you can understand how all those goods are achievable and how they're ordered uh, each to the others and all toward the common good and toward the good of each citizen or each member of society. Now we come to, however, uh, the, I mean, so we're looking at the macro picture. We're looking at political science as the science of all goods. Therefore, it's the master science. Now we come to the highest good. That is the highest human good, not the highest science of the good, but the highest human good. What, what human good could be final, that is complete, that encompasses everything in the way the political science encompasses all the other studies and all the other factors that go into um, a polity? What good is that? What does Aristotle mean by final then? Well, he answers it uh, with happiness. And then you, and then as a, as a leader of the seminar, you say, well, what does he mean by happiness? What makes for happiness? Uh, what do you have to do to be happy? Uh, what are some practical things that make you happy? You know, even corporal things, you know, bodily things, things that have to do with, you know, living and eating and and, uh, and rest and so forth. And what are some non-corporal goods uh, needed for happiness? Uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, the things that I mentioned about character. Well, there's a variety of kinds of happiness. We have pleasure, honor, and contemplation. So, you know, the pleasure is going to be largely a matter of of uh, corporal goods, or uh, goods uh, that uh, of the um, uh, of the flesh. Now we have other kinds of of pleasure. We have um, aesthetic pleasure, but even then, that's centrally based. So you look at a beautiful painting, you you see it, you hear a beautiful piece of music, you walk outside and take in the the beauty of the outdoors. Pleasure can also mean, um, uh, you know the. Uh, uh, the pleasure of of having a good friend, uh, which is a higher kind of pleasure. Uh, but um, I, another kind of happiness, and you know, I'm, and some people just want to have a life of pleasure, and that's just you know they just live for uh, the next meal or the next vacation or the next ball game to watch and so forth. Meals, vacations, and ball games are not inherently bad, um, but one can always already see that there may be something lacking in a life that's devoted to pleasure as one's. Uh, some total of happiness. But honor, well, honor becomes a little more social because one does things uh, among others, maybe even for others, for which one receives honor. Uh, you go into battle and you do a, a great job, an heroic job defending the, the city-state, or perhaps you um, have passed uh, legislation or enacted a law that ends up being really beneficial to everyone, and everyone's so happy that you were that person making the law or you were that person um, you know, um, enforcing it, say, or overseeing uh, it, its um, its promulgation and its uh, its enforcement. Uh, so, uh, or maybe you've written a wonderful play and uh, you've won the uh, spring festival competition uh, in honor of Dionysus, and uh, so you win an uh, honor, an accolade, a prize, right? Uh, sort of the an antiquities version of winning uh, the, the Oscar for uh, best uh, screenplay. And then there's the other kind of happiness it's called contemplation. And uh, contemplation, you know, means to, to use your mind to, to, 
to wonder about, to seek, to discover, to know, to understand, to grow in wisdom. In other words, you're, you're thinking about important things. What important things? Things about what it means to be human, uh, what it means to be just, important things like who are the gods? Uh, what, what is beauty? Um, uh, contemplating uh, one's own deeds in life. You know, you look back, a, a good man looks back on his life and he says, oh yes, I did these things and it gives me peace. It gives me solace. Uh, it gives me stability to know that I've accrued a whole set of actions that um, are not only honorable, but they also uh, reach into something that's lasting. And, um, and, you know, so the spiritual man is attuned to, to things that last. And uh, that's, the, that's the kind of thing that we, we do when we contemplate. Also, uh, we're in this in book one, although he doesn't go into great detail about uh, excellences or virtues, the Greek word for that would be uh, arte. Um, he does introduce them and, and already we get a glimpse that happiness has something to do with excellence. That is, um, the one who is truly happy is going to be the one who um, brings what we have naturally to their final ends to their completion, to the good that they're aimed at, right? So consistently, the man who is, is, who is virtuous is firing his moral and his intellectual and uh, his uh, filial uh, um, uh, arrows, and they're hitting the target consistently. So you're, you're racking up a, a lot of good action in your life. What does that mean? You're courageous consistently. You, you never fail to hold your post in battle or hold your post in the city. Um you, you think hard. You may not be a philosopher. You may not be a, a physicist or a metaphysician. That's okay. But, the, but our mind gives us a natural affinity for all things knowable. So the, the, the man of virtue is a man who's practiced again and again and again the practices of wondering, seeking, discovering, knowing, understanding, becoming wise. And uh, he, he racks up all this... Uh, activity of the mind until his mind is habitually um, uh, looking at the world and looking at the at other people and and, and understanding them. And uh, so you can already imagine that a strategos, that is a, 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 a civic or a military leader, understands people, understands uh, the world around him, and uh, pieces all, all of his knowledge together to make good decisions about how the, the military ought to move here, how, how the polis ought to grow, and so forth. Uh, as Aristotle most clearly delineates moral virtues from intellectual virtues, excellences of the will and excellences of the mind. There's a third kind of virtue that's a little foreign to our modern year, and that is friendship. And friendship uh, in Greek is philia, which is a, a kind of word or is a kind of love. And um, um, he develops this in great detail in books uh, seven to nine. I, I love those books, and I think your students are going to have such a great run when you take them uh, through them. Uh, students love to talk about friendship. Um, they long for friendship. It's one of the most important things in their lives. And uh, they have a lot to say about friendship. And I think um, it's always the case for my students that they learn a lot about their own friendships and uh, learned, in fact, that they need to examine their own presuppositions about friendship when they study friendship under Aristotle's uh, tutelage. But uh, uh, in a man's life, a man who is truly happy, a man who is racking up a life that we would say is a happy life, he will need to develop a moral and intellectual excellences. That is, he'll habitually do the right thing, and he'll habitually think well, and he'll habitually love well. And friendship would extend to family, to fellow citizens, to uh, comrades in battle, and to uh, you know, intimate uh, friends, as we normally think of friendship. To whom do we look for guidance? This is a, a very important concern to Aristotle that we know where to find standards. Um, the, our, you know, our students and we will work through a text and uh, one thing our students will want to know, you know is, is there something like a catalog, um, a glossary, a dictionary, you know, uh, an encyclopedia that Aristotle offers that this is exactly how to be happy, this is exactly how to be virtuous, this is exactly... Uh, how to live your life um, as a man or a woman of character. Well, there's an awful lot in the book and uh, a good rigorous reading of Aristotle will mean that one walks away with an awful lot of knowledge and insight. 
But one of the things, one of the insights that we find in Aristotle is that the place we look for guidance, the the, the one who is truly happy is uh, what he calls the spadias, the good man. And uh, what does he mean by that? He means that um, that no two people are exactly alike. And when you get a, a population of 25, 35,000 people, you get a big variety of human beings. And yet, uh, it seems to be a fact that within social groupings, there will be uh, exemplary individuals who say, wow, I want that person to lead because that person governs himself well or herself well, and, and that person will do a great job governing the rest of us. Or uh, within our school, a, a new teacher will turn to a, a veteran teacher and, and uh, he'll go to that veteran teacher's class and say, wow, that teacher did such a great job. I want to teach just like that teacher. Or a basketball player will learn from uh, older basketball players. In fact, all athletes get better at their sports by playing uh, men and women who are who are even better than they are at the sport. And that's how you grow. You might get beat multiple times by the better player until you start to play up to his or her level. And then you're really hitting pay dirt as an athlete. But always you're you're looking around, you're trying to see who's the standard. Who are the best athletes, the best writers, the best politicians, the best teachers, the best uh, civic and business uh, leaders? Who are the best doctors? You don't want to go get surgery from someone who's average. <laughs> you want to go to a surgeon who's really good and he'll take care of you and do a great job uh, bringing you to health. The spadias is the good man in the whole realm of character. As we want to follow uh, an individual who is a person of integrity, integrity meaning everything in that person holds together that is uh, the intellect and the will and the loves are all unified in, in his person so that even while we have good definitions of the good habits, uh, moral and intellectual, and the good habits proper to friendship, the ultimate standard is the spadias. Uh, and then, you know, um, this is true uh, even later on in theology. If you look at the the whole enormous body of the Summa Theologica by uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, while it's true he has a beautiful content for the natural law, and it's true he lays out all the um, the virtues, including the theological virtues, it's also true that the ultimate standard for Aquinas uh, is not an abstract proposition, but the person of, of Christ. Uh, we, in any given society, you know, Britain during World War II, Winston Churchill, uh, America during World War II, uh, particularly Dwight Eisenhower, um, or we look at the exemplary performance, uh, you know, we think of the best uh, violinists. These are the, the standards for all other violinists, like Itzhak Perlman uh, or uh, Isaac Stern. We, uh, we think of uh, the very best uh, navigators in all of history. Um, the remarkable feat that Shackleton pulled off uh, toward uh, saving his men. He had to uh, to uh, traverse some of the hardest waters in all, all the world. Or we think about the remarkable navigational powers of a Columbus making his way to the New World. Uh, we think about the unprecedented navigational uh, acumen uh, and practical judgments of all the men and women involved in the NASA space program, sending um, uh, rockets uh, and uh, crews of, of men uh, and women uh, into space. All these are our standards. And we look to them and say, okay, the, these are the spadioi. These are, the, these are the people that do really well. They do good at what, they, uh, what we all want to do well at. And, um, uh, but in particular in Aristotle, he's talking about the man who was morally and intellectually and affectively, that is having to do with love, um, a truly a good standard among us. Um, now, the student of politics must study the soul, Aristotle said. I'm still in book one, by the way, and only to the extent that the objects of his inquiry demand. All right, remember, you don't have to be a philosopher to benefit from the philosophical study that Aristotle takes us through. We all benefit from rigorous study in the liberal discipline of ethics and politics, so that we become more knowledgeable and wiser 
uh, in our own lives so that we not only can teach others about Aristotle, but we also make better decisions ourselves because we're better informed. Our minds are better shaped. Why does the study of politics demand an understanding of the soul? Why, according to Aristotle, is the study of politics more important for us than the study of medicine? Well, um, remember again in the polity, the best polities are the ones that serve everyone's uh, good. So uh, the, the monarch is a, is, has a soul that is well-ordered. The tyrant has a soul that is disordered. Um, if you uh, ever have read Plato's Republic, you'll, um, you'll work through the different kind, the, the genesis of the city and speech, and then the, the development of uh, monarchy, which eventually devolves down into tyranny. And along the way, Plato gives us an insight into the spiritual anatomy of each political type, each uh, type of political uh, leader. Remember, uh, Plato says politics is man writ large. That is, you look at any particular polity, a monarchy, an aristocracy, a democracy, a tyranny, and the there's a prototype or a, or, um, a chief type. Uh, and when that person or per, when those persons rule, the whole polity will look a lot like them. We all know that's true, right? So, you know, under a Stalin, life is going to be heck. Uh, uh, under a Churchill, we're, you know, the Brits came through uh, to victory. Um, under a just judge who uh, judges uh, without prejudice toward the, the contending parties, uh, justice is effected. Under a justice who's only looking out for the, the benefit of some and not for everyone, well, justice becomes a bludgeon, or that is law becomes a bludgeon uh, in injustice, uh, the effect. So and it, it matters what kind of a person rules. And so, of course, the, the student of politics has to study the soul. So now we return to our opening questions. Um, uh, the initial questions may not be answerable at first. And uh, uh, what you want to do is train your students to work through a text until the exposition by the writer becomes clear. So his argument from beginning to end becomes clear. His concepts unfolded through uh, the development of the text become clear. So now we can return to the opening questions. What is the subject matter? And what is Aristotle's methodology? And, and here's a little uh, sum, a little summary sheet. First of all, all things aim at an end or good. All right. And we, we learned that uh, every action, every study, every art, every science, making and studying, they all move toward an aim. And, uh, but just like the difference between getting the wrong answer and the right answer when you're trying to solve a problem, uh, getting the right answer makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? Because we're we're the we're aiming at the right answer, and then to understand why that's the right answer, well, that's pay dirt, isn't it? For uh, say a student of, of mathematics, to uh, to consistently shoot well in basketball, that's what we're aiming at, so that you're a a, um, a good shooter, or to dribble well, or to pass well. The final or complete good for humans is happiness. That is, beyond happiness, there really isn't uh, anything beyond that. It encompasses everything. It encompasses all the goods of your mind, all the goods of your will, all the goods of your relationships, all the good of the city or the country or the, the state that you dwell in. Uh, it encompasses things like health, intelligence, uh, good food, uh, longevity, uh, public reputation, all those things are goods that are, uh, are are that fall under the umbrella good that happiness is. If you get a man who's healthy, but his reputation is shot, he's been slandered, well, he's, not, he's probably not going to be very happy. If you get a man uh, who has a great reputation, but then his, his health completely deteriorates, well, uh, there's a great loss of happiness, isn't there? Now, Aristotle recognizes that a man who's lived a good life, a, a man of character, right, who's lived a good moral life, a good intellectual life, a good life of friendship, uh, will endure things like physical suffering better than those that don't. Uh, we also know that uh, the there are necessary political conditions. That's why the master science, politics, has to account for all the things that make a person happy. How are you going to be happy if you're not educated? Well, um, then the polity needs to take care of, uh, of, you know, good schools, academies like the Lyceum or the academy that, that you teach, where you teach, or uh, a university that you attend. Um, a polity will also have to provide for a diverse uh, or a division of labor, right? So people of various talents can 
can contribute to the economy and the economy uh, provides for all the things that humans need, either food, housing, uh, health care, all, all that kind of stuff. Very practical stuff, but it all makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, we also know that there's a correspondence between the highest happiness with what is highest in the human. That is, the highest thing in the human, according to Aristotle, is the mind. He even calls it in Greek, it's called the noose, which means the highest. It also means the divine. And you think about the, the mind not only can know things like biological um, uh, objects of study, uh, you know, animals, plants, and so forth. It can also understand things like numbers in the field of mathematics. It can also understand uh, the laws of physics, and it can even understand um, subject matters in theology. That is, we're talking about God, the eternal God. So the mind, the highest thing, is capable of studying the highest things. And and uh, and it makes sense that the, the, the highest thing uh, is the kind of the measuring rod for the highest activity or the highest end or purpose uh, or fulfillment, the final end that is happiness. And you can talk about happiness, of course, uh, in, uh, mostly uh, for Aristotle in this life. Uh, later on uh, in Western culture, of course, we'll absorb that kind of thinking and talk about uh, life hereafter. That is the happiness that that is the aim of all life is is something eternal. And we we participate in every level of reality. Aristotle knew that his theology is pretty thin gruel, but he knew that we participate in every level of, of reality from the physical to the spiritual. Uh, really wonderful stuff. I I, I encourage everyone to uh, to lead your students through the Nick and McKean ethics. Um, a really great guide that's helped me is one that my colleague, Mary Frances Lochran, uh, at Caney Academy has written called Leading a Seminar in Aristotle's Nick and McKean Ethics. You can read a sample for free on our website at our shop. Uh, you can also purchase it. And uh, right now, the Easter sale is still going on, so be sure and utilize um, He is Risen or Alleluia. <laughs> there are two uh, wonderful discounts. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and, um, and uh, get out of this. And we're back to um, we're back to our uh, our normal screen. I have a few more minutes here, and I just want to touch on a couple of things. Somebody wrote in and said, "Do you have any suggestions for resources to help study Homer's Iliad?" Uh, the writer said uh, uh, she got a lot out of the uh, episode that I did on Homer, but uh, wanted to know if there's something else. If I could encourage you to get one thing. First of all, remember I I recommended Richard Latimer's uh, translation of Homer's Iliad. Latimer also has a companion to the Iliad, and it's got um, terms and techniques um, and tools that Homer uses uh, in huge detail. I, I, I don't know that there's any question I haven't been able to answer uh, with uh, Latimer's companion at my side. A, a second question came in, as I am finishing the semester, I wonder if you have any tips on assigning a semester grade. Yes, I do. Uh, I would encourage you not just to average all the grades your student has accrued, but to look at the progress. And if the student, uh, say, has some poor grades early on, but it hits stride at some juncture and maintain that good stride, consider knocking out those, those uh, poor, deficient grades and recognize that your student has now learned everything you've asked him to learn and to do everything you've asked him to do. Um, I'm not asking you to give away grades. I'm saying look at the substantive progress, not just the average. And a final question is, uh, do you um, you do anything special for your graduating seniors? And we are coming up on, on graduation. So uh, I, I might have saved this question for May, but let me go ahead and, and, and say it now so you can start in on uh, the Andrew Zornerman uh, method for uh, honoring seniors. One thing I used to do when I, I had students in the classroom is um, I would share with them my love of used books. And um, I, I love to shop for used books. I go to used book sales at libraries and I go to um, garage sales. And I'm a big fan of the one or the $2 book. And for each of my students, I would get one of those books. And so my budget was never gonna break my back. And then I love to take uh, beautiful pages from magazines, maybe from a magazine uh, an outdoor magazine or a magazine that has uh, beautiful gardens or um, beautiful horses or things like that. And people will check their magazines, you know, the, the big ones that go on uh, coffee tables. And I love to carefully cut out those and then wrap my, my book 
and then uh, write a little note for each of my students inside the book that I give uh, give the student. That's a great way to honor students at the end of the year to to pass on your love of books and uh, to encourage them to, to buy used books and to build their libraries. Well, that's it for tonight. Hey, thanks a lot for joining us for the fourth episode of the Great Seminar Webinar Series. This particular episode will be on our website in about two weeks' time. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful night.